if you want to reconnect to their roots the best way to reconnect is go back to the river and go back to the forest a river means life tigris means life and if it flow life will continue See, in India, uh, river doesn't mean only water and uh, electricity or uh, water for irrigation or water for drinking. No, from the very beginning of our life till the end of our life, we are close to and we are related with our rivers. For indigenous peoples around the world, uh, rivers and our resources are our life, the source of our identity the source of our ways of life and culture. For me, a river means uh, it's something which connects everybody. It connects culture, it connects all the different landscapes. The river and the water in it and the life it supports and the landscape and the people are all one. It's just part of how everything fits together. It's part of the heart of the country. Rivers mean life for us because that's, that's, that's what we use for drinking water, for washing our skin, for fishing, for transportation, for all, all of our life is depend on the river. Over time, we've built a lot of dams on the world's rivers. There are now more than 50,000 large dams. And those dams have had a lot of impact on these people, these two billion plus people that depend upon rivers for their well-being. How many people have lost their food security, lost their drinking water supply, lost their ability to make an income by working with and taking from the river? We built a database that now includes um, 120 rivers from 70 different countries that document the changes that have occurred and how many people were affected. So our estimate could only take into account the number of people below the 7,000 dams. The number could very easily be more than 500 million. I wouldn't be surprised that it might be as high as 700 or 800 million or even higher. When the dam was commissioned, the entire area was submerged. Uh, about 54,000 square miles were inundated by, by the Kapta Hydroelectric Project, the dam, because of the dam. And people lost all their hearts and homes, their ancestral land. Those who used to live in the river basin, they came to, the, to live on the top of the hill. So they have no land to cultivate. They have to change their profession. And due to this Gapta hydroelectric project, people became so much poor, so much their life uh, has been so much devastated that after certain years, uh, there was a struggle for self-determination. And the people of Chito Hintrex, that is the indigenous people of Chito Hintrex, they um, fought against the Bangladesh army for, the, uh, for 25 years because they had no other alternative but to take to arms. Una mañana, cuando terminó la represa, sentíamos un ruido que venía, no sabíamos de dónde, y cuando Salimos para, eh, nos levantamos de nuestras camas para ir a mirar de dónde venía ese ruido. Nos encontramos que pisamos la, el agua. Era que la represa levantaba su primer nivel de agua. Y de repente te encontrás con que no tenés ya nada. 
ni el lugar donde naciste ya no tenés. Hace 17 años que pasó eso. Y aún seguimos en la misma lucha porque no hay trabajo. Seguimos estando tan pobres porque no tenemos trabajo. Porque la entidad no nos dio ninguna posibilidad. Y hay muchos convenios, pero ninguno de los convenios se cumplió. Scientists who've been studying rivers have been discovering a lot of new information over the past 20 years. And this is information about the importance of the variability and the, of the flow regime, how it's not just a minimum flow or a steady flow that represents a healthy river, but it's how the flow changes over time and what those different levels and types of, of flow events are, are doing for the river. Uh, but that's not well understood by decision makers. The connection between a river and a floodplain is also not well understood by most people and, and also by decision makers. Um, and so when I was talking about how different flow levels do different things, one of, those that, one of those things that they do is that a high flow connects a river to its floodplain. And a floodplain is often the most productive part of the entire river. But river management and, and dams that are storing floods often uh, they disrupt that connectivity because there, there's no more high flows and you just have this narrow uh, narrow river that no longer is is able to to be flooding uh, all this uh, you know uh, the productive flood plants my community lives on the downstream where they want the, to build the give a tree dam and this means they will be affected the lake is a source of life fluid for my community because most of the people are involved in fishing activities. At the same time, pastoralism, you know, our animals get water from the lake. So any interference with the lake ecosystem will damage the people's life. All my life, I have known nothing better than spending my time and my family's life around Lake Turkana with the active struggle that I have been involved in around the Gibe, stopping the Gibe 3 dam that's being built on the Omo River, which is the only lifeline to Lake Turkana. It may be in Ethiopia, but it flows into Lake Turkana. Both countries own this, this river. I speak for 800,000 people who are all fighting together for the survival of our ethnicity, not just the Turkana people. We have the Nyangatom, the Elmolo, the Samburu, the Dasnach, and many other communities who all depend on this lifeline. So that is the reason why we know that even when we fall, we will stand up and we will continue to fight. It's not going to be one day, it's not going to take one week. It's going to take a long time, it's going to take a lot of energy, but we know that at the end of it all, we will stand up victorious. Climate change is going to have a huge impact on how the rivers will flow, how much water will flow in the rivers, when the water will flow in the rivers. That's the whole hydrology of the rivers and of course that is the most critical component uh, for dam planning and operation. Unfortunately, uh, we find that all over the world, dams are being planned, have been planned, have been designed, have been sized without giving any consideration at all to what climate change is going to do for the hydrology of the rivers. There are two ways in which this is going to impact the dams in the future. Uh, I think the most critical is that it's going to make dams far more risky because you're going to have uh, glacial, the glaciers, the Himalayan glaciers melting, which is also going to lead to much higher flows in the rivers in the initial years. Now this means that dams which have been designed for lower flows will suddenly find themselves being flooded with much, much higher flows and that of course makes it far more risky from the dam safety point of view. Uh, but you know, you also are going to have later on subsequently after the glacial melt, then you're going to have much uh, lesser flows in the lean seasons, but maybe even the overall flows will go down uh, quite dramatically. Now this means that the dams will underperform. So you have huge investments of billions and billions of dollars uh, with huge impacts sitting there and not having maybe enough water to deliver uh, the benefits. How do you connect to your everyday life? And the water we drink, 
the food that we eat and the healthy climate that we have even the climate change that we are talking about i think that all that we should be able to connect to the changes that are occurring in our river basins and how do we look at our water because people now have a tendency to talk to look at water and river differently el lugar de donde yo provengo hay allí hay un río hermoso se llama Carrelofu es un río de aguas verdes eh, transparente que quieren represar una de las eh, el principal impulsor de esta represa es eh, el grupo español Santander que yo son dueños de una importante empresa de aluminio y bueno con la excusa de que necesitan más energía eléctrica quieren represar y a tan solo 20 kilómetros de donde nosotros vivimos hay una está el estado ya la frontera del estado chileno con 180 exploraciones mineras son lo que nosotros vemos que las represas y la minería van de la mano sí nos opusimos desde el comienzo porque eh, de, por nuestra visión espiritual filosófica este, cultural entendemos que la vida del río es muy importante si silencian los ríos, silencian la voz del pueblo mapuche. Por eso no hay forma de, de diálogo ni de negociación posible. Y creo que eso también el gobierno lo ha visto de manera así contundente, por eso ha tenido que, que incurrir en terrorismo de Estado, ¿no? Ha, ha generado una situación injustificada y, e invisibilizada. O sea, el pueblo argentino no se enteró que eso pasó en el sur de la Patagonia. Nosotros tenemos seis años luchando y compañeros que acaban de llegar llevan 30 en sus países luchando contra las presas. Así que nosotros los vamos a, los vamos a, a, a seguir, a luchar 30 a 40 años para que el Temaca no desaparezca. parece que en el proceso de la lucha, de la resistencia, eso es fundamental. Que las comunidades, un pueblo como aquí en Temacapolín, sientan que no están solos. Y eso fortalece el ánimo de resistencia de una manera impresionante. Porque en, el, en, los, en los procesos de lucha hay, hay altas y bajas, altas y bajas. Hay mucho desánimo, hay impotencia, coraje. Cuando vienen y se encuentran con otras experiencias, es una reactivación de la esperanza bien importante. La confianza humana, la confianza política se da cuando, cuando las personas nos encontramos. For everybody, dam means more electricity. So we told them what you're going to lose is more than electricity. What you're going to lose is your fish, you're going to lose your water, what you're going to lose is your peace and happiness. So you're going to lose so many things. What's the real cost of the loss of forests? How can we, as human beings, estimate what is the cost of the loss of waterfalls? So there's 1.6 billion people in the world that don't have access to electricity. And large mega projects are not the way to solve that crisis. The dam was proposed to the government to meet the energy needs uh, of the region um, and it claimed that this is the only option, the best option. However, when we looked into it in more detail, we realized that this was, there was a lot of risks. Mozambique is really highly dependent on hydro and we decided to lobby the government to look at the proper detailed um, option assessment 
the only thing they looked at is where to put the wall and they called that options because they said we found six different places and we chose this one that was our option assessment and we couldn't get them to do more than that so we decided to do it ourselves Mozambique actually is one of the lucky countries from solar which is a common um, energy source in Africa to wind to biomass to micro hydro and we showed with similar funds actually less producing quite a large chunk of what they claimed only was possible with hydro and we also ended up assessing the sector seeing why is alternative energy is not taken serious um, and realized that it's mainly policy and will from the government um, and business as usual big is what they want and they're trying to and for them it's useful not to have these studies not to have these um, this research because it allows them to continue doing this dirty business we have only 14% of the country with electricity. If we do it correctly, we'll have a good found structure to grow and will be sustainable, clean, low impact and meet the real needs of the country. And that's what we're focusing on. Not anti-dams, pro-dams, it's for clean, sustainable energy for our needs and for the future. There are a lot of uncertainties in climate change. We, we, we don't know whether how much is going to happen, in which direction, to what extent. And that means that our responses have to be flexible. Now, dams are among the most inflexible responses because you are putting in huge chunks of your resources, of your money, into this one big project. Which is why solar, it's such a democratic energy. I mean, the sun shines everywhere and you can produce electricity right where you need it. I think the key is that we need to be talking about decentralized options. And, you know, you don't say that there's one big dam, you want to replace it by one big wind power station. I think that would really be completely wrong. The most successful projects have been projects where the community has really taken it upon themselves to, you know, they are involved in the entire process of deciding which technology is most appropriate for their community, whether it's solar power or wind power or very micro hydro power where you don't need a dam, you just use a little portion of the river. Um, even larger community sized systems with wind power or solar. So decentralized energy is such a much more efficient and safe and reliable way to get electricity to people than large centralized power plants somewhere. That also gives you much more flexibility in terms of spreading out the resources, in terms of meeting uh, the ch challenges of climate change because then you know you have many, many smaller projects and you can have more flexibility in dealing with the new situation. We fought a dam proposal on the Mary River, which is uh, just north of Brisbane in Queensland, Australia. Uh, the proposal was to dam the river right in the middle of the river f uh, to extract water for urban water supply into a, an urban water grid. Um, we thought it was a very poorly thought out proposal and we made the strongest case we could against it. We fought very hard for three and a half years and um, in the end we managed to get a decision from the federal government under a federal environment law to stop the dam from going ahead and now we're looking at ways of um, improving river management and water management so that we don't have to fight something like this again. All in that three and a half years of campaigning we saw all this change and we saw that the water use for the average person uh, dropped from 350 litres per person per day down to 150 litres per person per day. So that's a huge change in three and a half years through education, through governments imposing some changes, encouraging people to put in rainwater tanks to capture water where it falls, which is so obvious uh, solution, and more water efficiencies within the house, water recycling, using water more than once through a house, uh, and of course looking at, at lastly, options like desalination, uh, which is not climate dependent, so very, very important. However, there continues to be, from the state, uh, indications they would like to take more water, and so we continue to fight to call into question their reasoning of why they need it, when we see that there are alternatives which are not only better for the environment, they are cheaper and more sustainable in the long term. So uh, we, we continue our fight for water, for the river, because one of the uh, important things, it's not often that 
we're stopping Dan, so it is, uh, we want to be able to share our learnings with others to help them. I feel that a person who is working or trying to work, I mean, I'm do something about water, should also be looking at a river. So according to me, it's all the same. And it is a, it's a continuous dynamic entity. So I, I, I would like to look at river conservation in that way. So according to river conservation doesn't mean stopping a dam. River conservation according to me means saving a river. This is not a movement of individuals, just one person fighting for something. It is a global movement. It is a global movement to protect the world's lifeline, not just for ourselves, but for our children, for generations to come. The global struggle against dams is not just about saving one's own land or saving one's own life, but it's really about saving the planet because it's about saving rivers and it's about conserving rivers, and rivers are the planet's lifeline. Rivers for life. 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 Rivers for Rivers for life. 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 R